this is actually not really a lecture. It's more a start of a dialogue. It's about an idea I've been carrying around with me for many, many years now. Um, and this idea is about the world of unrealized ideas that, that exist in, in everyone, every creative's bottom drawers. There are these ideas that we were excited about. And if we're in a professional setting, we pitched it to the client and um, they unfortunately settled for the second best or third best or fourth best solution. And this is something that happens to architects, that happens to designers, to artists, musicians, scientists, engineers, everyone who creates something um, is not always able to bring forth the most, the boldest, the most innovative ideas. And that happened throughout history. So, and as a result, unfortunately, yeah, that's the bad news. We have to live in a world of compromise. What would world look like? What would our life look like? if we liberated these ideas. So as a species, you could say our inventiveness is boundless. But why is our world not more advanced than it is? And why are we not living in the best possible world? So why is this an important question to me? I think it started very, very early as a, as a little kid in the 1970s, a little guy here on the left here on the carousel. That's me, that's my dad here in the middle. And um, I grew up in a, in, a, in a relatively nondescript German town called Kassel. Nothing but, uh, nothing very exciting, except for every five years, there was the biggest contemporary art festival. It still goes on. Every five years, the whole city transformed for a hundred days into what, as a little child of, you know, seven years, looked like the future to me all these crazy artists and installation artists, uh, Klaus Oldenburg, Walter de Maria, architects, they all flocked to that city. And all of a sudden, this, the future happened. And this was like the 1970s version of the future. People were trying experimenting with inflatables, with alternative habitats. Uh, they took psychedelic drugs and did all kinds of crazy stuff. And it just looked like the future to me. And this is the future that I wanted to live in. And I became obsessed with the idea of future. And this childlike fascination, maybe you can relate to that as well. When you think back to the age of maybe 10 or so, you know, things were bigger than life because we were smaller than life. And uh, things were just this feeling of absolute fascination is something that drives all my creative work, um, whether it's exhibitions, design, media and art installations, or what I call media texture. And sometimes I manage for a glimpse to create this childlike fascination in my audience again, but sometimes it doesn't work so well. You, you can't, there's not like a surefire recipe to, to accomplish that. So this thing about fascination, this thing about these bold ideas, um, I try to illustrate with 10 super short stories that I'm going to share with you tonight that I put together here. Um, and I think, or I'm sure, I'm certain you all creators, that you can come up with your own experiences and stories of ideas that you wish would have come true. So let's dive right in here. And I also try to, you know, unpack a little bit about why some of these ideas might not have flown at this point in time when they were conceived and presented. So let's go back in history. Um, many ideas actually are far ahead of the mindset of their time. The time the people who had the say were just not ready for them. And um, staying here close to my hometown in Berlin, um, there was uh, an architectural exhibition in 1921 and a, and a young, totally unknown uh, a guy, an architect called Mies van der Rohe. He had a competition entry of a glass tower on this triangular shape. And it was so foreign to the contemporaries that he got kicked out of this uh, competition in the first round, no questions asked. They just said, okay, this is outlandish. Um, it was the first full class architecture and it was just dismissed right away. And half a century later, it actually became the template for modern glass skyscrapers. 
Um, another thing is we often hear about progress and sometimes progress is just regress and that's kind of a sad story. Um, things that were more advanced and ahead of their time didn't stay that way. And um, as, as Hank mentioned, I, I lived in, uh, in, in uh, Los Angeles for about 14 years to work at Art Center. And I found out that in this traffic choked, crazy car city, it actually in, in 1925, it had the world's largest, most sophisticated public transit system. So until the 1960s, when all of these streetcars, all of the public transportation that was on rails was demolished, dismantled, coinciding with the building up of the freeway system for motor cars. Uh, some people uh, speak of the great American streetcar scandal. And if you imagine what it would take now nowadays in the 21st century to rebuild a city of a size of Los Angeles back with trolleys, which are now acknowledged as one of the most, uh, uh, the best and most sustainable uh, modes of transportation in, in urban emphasis. So uh, no progress, regress. Um, the next example, the next short story is about the idea, the vision of solving large cargo transport transport around the world in a sustainable way. And outside of Berlin, about 80 kilometers away from Berlin, there was a company that was started in 1999 called Cargo Lifter. And Cargo Lifter was uh, a couple of um, ambitious entrepreneurs who wanted to revolutionize air cargo um, with a gigantic airship. And here you can see it in, in comparison to, to a jumbo jet. So a jumbo jet is about 71 meters long. Uh, if you're not metric, uh, then this is about like 100 and I would say almost 200 feet. And this cargo lifter airship um, is 260 meters long. So just calculate that by, by two and a half and then you've got um, almost three, then you know how long it is in feet. So this ginormous kind of um, cargo ship would have had the opportunity to lift, have a payload, lift three, what was it? 320,000 pounds in one piece and 80 meters long. So a gigantic piece of cargo could have been lifted with very little energy expense throughout the world. Well, and to build such a blimp, you first have to build a hangar. You have to build a garage, basically. And this became the world's largest freestanding hangar outside here of Berlin that was built. And when it was ready, the hangar, um, I had the pleasure actually to design the opening ceremony. And my idea was to play on the scale of, of this enormous airship. And uh, we built in the volume, as you can see down here on the left side, that, that is the, the payload. And then the dimensions of the actual airship, um, I depicted, because we have very little money, um, with actually these uh, uh, fabric banners. And these fabric banners came out of little rucksacks from people. So there were people at a certain point in the show who upset themselves, uh, each trailing one of these, these uh, fabric banners here. And if you look very closely on, on the screen, you can see these tiny little people there uh, that actually make up this big airship. And since I couldn't get any actors to do this, I actually used the construction workers of this hangar to actually do this performance here. So ironically, uh, the opening was in 2001 and six months later, Cargo Lifter unfortunately went bankrupt. And this big idea of this uh, air, air cargo was uh, put uh, to sleep and so this amazing hangar, the biggest freestanding hall in the world, was turned into a water park that is now called Tropical Islands, which is kind of an ironic inversion of the vision of connecting the world because it's kind of inverted and it's kind of like a beach themed Truman show now. So this is where this big vision and idea uh, has landed. The next short story um, is 
what happens when very ambitious plans have to rely on too many parties and stakeholders? Um, then they're, they're very prone to fail. And this example um, is, go, is about a company, an organization actually, called Desert Tech. And this, this organization was founded on a very striking insight because they found out that within six hours, deserts of the world receive more energy from the sun that humankind consumes within one year. So think about that. Six hours, one year, all the energy in the world is right there. If you look at the map on the right-hand side, you see the Sahara, you see North Africa, you see parts of Europe. And the plan was to actually plant huge uh, sun collectors and wind parks at the coasts um, around the Sahara, and then take all this energy and distribute it both in North Africa and also in Europe. And um, this uh, started out, uh, it was an initiative that started in 2009. It crashed in 2015, just because um, the consortium of the energy providers, they fell apart. They all had different uh, financial interests and then the political self-interests of the involved countries took over. And boom, this grand plan that would have uh, solved uh, a huge energy problem uh, that was becoming more present pressing every day, as we all know from the news, uh, would have been solved, but it fell through. So sometimes um, in my next little story, I talk about incrementalism. And the idea behind that is that even when great designers, designs make it from vision into production, they often get compromised on the way. So incrementalism, you could call that the slow and the gruesome death of ambition. And a, a very striking uh, example, at least for me, because I'm, I'm kind of like a, a, a still an automotive fan. I have like um, have gasoline in my blood um, is actually uh, automotive design and, and cars. And um, so, so this is, for example, uh, um, a, a car, a concept that was very future forward. It was like the minivan reinvented, as you can see, gull wing doors, super aerodynamics, super chic. Um, it came from a company called Pontiac, which you might be familiar with. And this was the transport concept car in 1986. And actually it made it into production, but it looked like this. So if you can see the before and the after, yes, they got the color scheme right, but everything else they kind of got wrong. And um, why has this happened? So, you know, in the realization process, there's safety regulations, there's engine engineering shortcuts, there's the so-called value engineering, how can I make stuff cheaper and charge more for it? And all of that has thwarted many future forward creations actually beyond recognition and therefore it has throttled and slowed down overall progress. So cars could be much more advanced than they actually are these days. And if you think that stopped somewhere with the goofy cars of the 1990s, unfortunately that's not true. That carries through to uh, the very today. Um, even, you know, Mercedes-Benz, which now rolls out their luxury electric sedans with the EQS concept from 2019, the car that now is going into production looks like that. And um, <laughs> they must have said, you know what, at least as, as long as we, you know, keep the two-tone color scheme, maybe no one will really notice how fucked up the car is now. But um, yeah, it, uh, it speaks for itself. and. It is a prime example of great ideas just going horribly wrong. Um, the next little story here I call Hype Cycle. Hype Cycle is something that um, is often associated with disruptive technology, disruptive inventions. So sometimes disruptive ideas start out with a great vision and ambition and before they um, before they actually then get reined in by the so-called reality, I would say. And this is an example that 
Um, we actually did at Graph Brand Lab here. So we had the great pleasure to work on a super forward looking project uh, about urban air mobility. So that means passenger drones that can vertically start and land and are electric uh, driven and um, are the future of urban transportation. So, so this vehicle actually needs some kind of a hub. It needs like, like, a, like a, uh, um, um, a hub where it can start and land. And with that, it needs a lot of design because um, this urban air mobility is, is a few, symbol of future forward technology. And what we tried to do is to create through design as much trust as possible in in this kind of new technology. So before I sit down in a, in a, in a kind of a wobbly, electrically driven uh, little vehicle that's going to fly through an urban densely populated area, um, I have to start uh, establish a trusting relationship. And this is what in the got into the design of that. That was our main driving factor and also to capture the fascination of it. And this proposal that you just saw won basically every award in, in the book last year because it really is triggered by our fascination with the future and, and disruptive technology. So um, now from our prototype that we built in Singapore and showed in 2019, um, we're developing this idea further or the client has this idea being developed further. And I'm not allowed to show you anything, but if you look beyond these pixels here, you can see that out of our organically flamboyant future forward architecture, something that more resembles some like containers and shipping containers are evolving out of it. And that's a very sad story because neither will this create a lot of trust um, with the client, nor will it really capture the fascination that this future forward mobility has. So this is kind of a, a, a thing that's common to many disruptive technologies. And there is um, an organization, the Gartner Institute, they have created the so-called Gartner hype cycle. And that is, um, it's a graph that captures the pathway of disruptive technologies um, through their different phases. And if you look at this, uh, uh, this graph here, you see that in the beginning, there's an innovation trigger and the expectations, they go really, really, really high to a peak. And where I put the, the red arrow, this is where the flying autonomous vehicles are right now. And then there is a peak of inflated expectations. And then there's a trough of disillusion. Oh, this technology is much harder to implement than we thought. For example, you know, autonomous driving is right now in this valley of disillusion and people get really frustrated. Why the hell is it not started yet? And then slowly, if these ideas don't die, um, then there is a slope of enlightenment and then the plateau of productivity. And if you look at this, you see that it is about 10 years away that uh, the flying autonomous vehicles then go from this prototype and this vision and this expectation to something that we can actually use and have in our world. So um, this is a good explanation why certain things um, go from a hype to a bust. Um, the next little story here is about how commercial interests sometimes get into the way of the greatest ideas. And for this little story, I turn to a former student of mine uh, his name is Dan Goods, um, and he has one of the coolest jobs in the world, I think, for creative, because he works at NASA JPL. So he works with rocket scientists, and he started out as their artist in residence. And to come up through his art, through his creativity, um, with solutions that explain to the general public what these crazy rocket scientists are actually doing. So he uses art to translate the immensity of the universe and the complexity of space missions into relatable experiences. So now he calls himself a visual strategist and he has a team of about half a dozen uh, designers and architects and artists. And all they do all day long is to come up with ideas how to translate all the amazing rocket science stuff that, that NASA does. And his example that he shared with me, I said, well, give me your best idea that didn't go anywhere. 
um, is this one here. Um, and this is a, um, a, a project he did around the Juno mission. So uh, NASA is sending a probe, uh, a satellite called Juno to orbit, um, to orbit Jupiter for 33 times to take certain you know, photos and whatever they do up in space, and then to fall into this planet. 33 and a third times, it's also the speed of a record. I know you might be too young for that, but like a vinyl record um, had 33 uh, and a third time rotations as a speed. And the main uh, scientists behind this mission here, uh, the Juno mission, loved music. And so Dan and his team came up with the idea um, to find 33 artists, music artists, um, to each create a new track and beam that track to the spacecraft at Jupiter with each rotation, with each orbit, one of these tracks, send them there. Um, the planet would affect the music and then it would be beamed back and then released on Earth here, one track after the other. And this idea was so outlandish, but also so realistic that he had like the, the biggest acts in music right now, in pop music, to sign up on. It's a who is who of popular music. And everyone was in and said, okay, I'm going to compose and perform a track just for this Jupiter mission, and I'm going to do this free of charge. And um, there was also the biggest, one of the biggest music distributors who was going to make it happen. However, the catch was that the music had to be free since it was NASA and NASA is a government agency and they can't charge the public. So the musicians were okay with it, but the distributor was not. And because of that, the NASA said uh, it would not advertise the music on the project. And Dan's project after six years of work just fell through. So great idea. And it just died um, by the need for commercialism here. Okay, but there's also hope. You know, there are ideas that are not only ahead of their time, but the time is actually catching up in a good way, or it's changing the time to really um, make the likelihood that these ideas come through much higher. And um, for example, um, this uh, that I'm showing here um, now coincides with our heightened awareness to come up with solutions against climate change. And uh, this is from Graft Architects. Um, and they designed this building, uh, these buildings in 2007. And it was a first prize and invited design composition, uh, competition. And they called this building uh, Birds Island. And those are zero energy villas in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And the special thing about it is that all the energy saving requirements were actually translated into very poetic design solutions that are not only environmentally friendly and efficient, but also offer a new interpretation of the spaces we live in. And now it is really high time to establish a sustainable design language that marries technology with aesthetics. And this was a great expression of that. And the time is now getting ready for these ideas to really uh, uh, come through and become more commonplace. My second to last story, I call it almost there. Um, there's also sometimes ideas that slowly scale up. And this is another project that I did a while ago. And it started out with a Kindle reader you might be familiar with. Um, this has a so-called e-paper display. And this is not like your computer screen that sends out light. This is actually a display that just reflects light. So it changes color like a chameleon and you read it like ink on paper. And that has a lot of advantages because it's easy on the eye. Yeah. And it has extremely low energy consumption. And the company that actually pr produces these screens, the technology is called e-ink. And they somehow, they saw some of my uh, public artworks and they called me up and said, well, you're an artist, uh, you work with these weird materials and um, we have our material and we can print it out now a mile long in one endless coil, our e-paper, but we don't know what to do with it. And I said, well, maybe I can help you. And um, I um, devised a media facade here at the um, San Diego International Airport 
uh, that is 1600 feet long and it is covered with this e-paper and can change and can be programmed to change uh, uh, its patterns and its motion here. And they said, you can do anything you want with this facade, but you cannot drill any holes into the facade because it's a new building. We don't want you to do that. So if you can't drill any holes, you can't send any conduit. Um, and if you can't send any conduit, you can't send any electricity to these tiles. So each of these tiles had to be self-sufficient. And each of these tiles has a little photo photovoltaic strip that collects just enough energy uh, for this to be functional. It has a little battery and a little receiver, and it's all laminated like a like a, uh, a fast food uh, a menu card, you know, in this clear plastic, so it is weatherized. And you have a sticker that is actually a sticker that can change color by uh, remote control. And this idea is realized there, and it works. And now the next step for this to scale it up is actually to find a building, to find an architect, to find uh, someone who finances a facade that's not stuck on the building, but that becomes the building. So the building itself and the media become, become one seamless thing. And this is my vision that I really want to put through. Uh, this can happen in an urban environment because it is zero energy, uh, zero light pollution, which is a problem in urban uh, environments and it's completely zero energy self-sufficient and the technology is there so it's an idea just waiting um, to come through and I won't stop until I have built this damn thing so my last my very last short story for you tonight is um, I called it lucky us because thankfully some ambitious projects did not get realized and um, maybe you can come up with some of these ideas um, um, of, of examples where it's like, oh, good thing we didn't do it. But the example that came to me um, is also connected uh, to my hometown, Berlin. Um, you heard about the Nazis, you heard about Adolf Hitler who took over Germany uh, in 1930s and then he started a war in 1942 and um, he was completely off the rocker and he wanted to dominate the world and wanted to turn Berlin into Germania, the city that becomes the capital of the world. So absolutely crazy and, and, and dangerous. And his main architect, Albert Speer, he um, redesigned Berlin and he created uh, um, an outrageous architecture here um, this is uh, the Halle des Volkes, which is like much bigger than the cargo lifter uh, thing I showed you before. And this was going to host hundreds of thousands of people. And it was just a demonstration of, of, of power in, in, the, in, the, in the most horrific way. Um, if maybe some of you have heard of the TV show, uh, The Man in the High Castle, it's like an alternate reality show. What would have happened to the world if the Nazis had won the war? That's the premise of it. And then the show also turns to uh, Berlin, which was now called Germania. And this little building down here um, is, is actually uh, uh, the, 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 the um, main building uh, in Berlin, which is now dwarfed by, by the Große Halle. Um, and fortunately, this did not happen. So that means that the Reichstag, which this building is called, which is like the symbolic seat of the German parliament, then was wrapped as one of his art pieces in 1995. And it became really a social space for the reunited Germany. So this horrific uh, uh, Nazi vision didn't come through and the opposite happened um, through an art intervention that brought people together and reminded everyone of you know, their humanity and celebrate the reunification of Germany. So my conclusion after these 10 little stories here um, is, you know, I, I want to ask the people, and I started tonight with you guys, and I'm going to talk to many other people there, really to find opportunities to bring more joy into the world. You know, to, to take your hand off the handbrake, say no to incrementalism, fight for your visions and share your ideas, and help me figure out what 
are your boldest ideas? What did you hear from ideas that you have yourself or ideas you heard of that you think are in the bottom drawer and need to be liberated? So my vision is to actually create something like a better verse experience, which could be uh, an, an ex experience in the sense of an exhibition um, that actually shows the true ingenuity that exists on our planet. So what are your bottom drawer projects and um, help me to put this thing together? I really want to do that project. And I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> So we can, um, now's a great time to ask some questions and, and bring some provocation actually to the table from your own viewpoint. Everybody here, yeah, the young people that you are, your future is ahead of you to do something like what Nick is talking about, to find the opportunities uh, in this world that can bring joy to the world. So what would that look like to you and what questions might you want to pose? Now's a great opportunity, one Nicholas. Feel free to um, just unmute your mic, guys, and ask. Or if you don't want to do that, I can ask them for you. Just drop your questions in the chat. How do you find the right audience for your ideas? It's like sometimes when you've come up with something really strange, like it's hard to know would someone be interested in this because there might not be an industry for it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think this has gotten much easier because, you know, your tools to, you know, to, to showcase things are, have gotten so much more sophisticated. I mean, you can, you can post stuff on social media, on Insta or somewhere else, on LinkedIn or whatever is your favorite portal um, and uh, um, uh, it get them out there. Um, it is, from my experience, the, the, the time of the lone genius is kind of over. Um, it is right now, things have gotten so complex, our you know, creative opportunities and design challenges that it, it works much better in teams of, of like-minded people. Find them, collaborate with them. You can collaborate through different time zones. Uh, you can collaborate through different languages. Um, try to, to get some people around your idea, rally them around the idea. I always, as a creative, I like to work with people that I, that I know are smarter than I am because that's the most exciting stuff. So find those people, bring them together um, and, and, and find your outlet for it. Thank you. Okay, there is a question in the chat which says, which are your go-to websites you visit before you start working on a new project to get inspiration and or visual references? Huh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I stay away from go-to websites. I mean, I Google stuff. Of course I do. Um, but I'm, I'm very wary of pre-curated things. I mean, there are great, there, there, there's great, you know, blogs and, and things, of course, uh, 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 whether it's design boom or, you know, whatever you call them, um, they exist, but it feels kind of like pre-digested and I want to discover this stuff myself. And I want to draw things out of, you know, chance encounters. When I Google, you know, a term or I go into an image search or so, um, it's, it's always the discovery of, things I wasn't exactly looking for, but they happen to be there and they're not pre-curated. They're still in the raw. And then I go down the rabbit hole. For me, this is much more interested than finding, you know, something that is already set by someone else who thinks that might be interesting to me. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with, um, what was the best way to describe it? Like kind of like a sense of imposter syndrome? Because in, a, in our field, I know we do a lot of creative things. And sometimes you meet these professionals and they're like, oh, I'm an interactive art designer for, and then insert a huge name company. How do yeah. you not feel like, because it feels like no matter what I add to my portfolio, it's never enough. Like, even though I know it may be for some companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, I think a, a certain amount of, 
you know, I wouldn't say self-doubt, but a little bit of like, okay, um, um, being a little bit critical with your own ideas and abilities is not wrong. Yeah. So this is for, for you, you, you know, the bullshit detector that we all should have, just as you said, you know, um, towards other people who just like spew this kind of stuff. Um, should also be a little bit of self-criticality with yourself. So, for example, in preparing this this presentation today, which I did for tonight, I had often the point of like, oh, is this even interesting? Um, is this really just you know, can I can I get any kind of excitement across? And so, um, so I think it doesn't hurt to ask yourself these questions, but then to actually also be aware that. Uh, in, 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 in Germany, we have this thing, everyone is cooking with water, yeah, no matter what, what they imposter, um, uh, uh, everyone at the end of the day, you know, who is halfway aware is, you know, is, is asking themselves, you know, are my ideas interesting enough? Are they good enough? And, um, and as long as that keeps you going and keeps you trying and, and trying new things, then I think that's not the worst thing. So the bullshit detector that you have towards your own ideas, you should also have towards other people. And, and that makes you, you know, in comparison, not feel like dwarfed by like overbearing, uh, uh, you know, I know it all creative creatives, because at the end of the day, I think as creatives, we're all kind of being driven by the same ambitions and ideas. And we also have the same vulnerabilities. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, Nick. I'm Shake. I'm an art director and I'm really hey, into fashion. And as you know, like fashion is becoming a like a worldwide issue because of fast fashion. Absolutely. So in my better verse, there's a way to make fashion like have more longevity, more utility. And yes. I was wondering if you had any ideas on that as well, because I feel like we could be doing more to make fashion last longer and to yeah. give people, I guess, when I saw that technology with the e-paper, I thought about like, yeah. how could that translate maybe into some kind of fibers that, what if my white shirt could be pink tomorrow instead Absolutely. of having to buy a pink one? Like, so that's where my ideas come from as far as like my better verse of fashion. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fascinating what, what, what you're saying. And, and it's really, you know, because the people talk now about slow fashion and you know buy something that will last you forever and and so it's not only physically lasting forever but you never get tired of it but you know that's not fashion so right. i think in, in fashion you actually have this conundrum you have this problem to me fashion is the fact that it changes and that you can articulate you know your white mood uh, one day and your pink mood the next day and the green mood the following day so so this change somehow needs to be needs to be available and it needs to be a part of, of expression so we can't just like all wear black t-shirts for the rest of our lives that are harvested in some sustainable way that's not gonna that's not gonna fly it so we actually need you and your ingenuity and your curiosity and um, um, inventiveness to actually make that happen so we can still have that change we can still have the expression but we do it in a more mindful way. So, so you're right on. I don't have a perfect solution for you, but I think that if this is your goal for the better for us, uh, Shake, then uh, go for it. Maybe talk to some material scientists, look at you know what kind of materials get recycled. Um, think about deconstructing pieces that are already there and reconstructing them in different ways, um, you know? think about maybe there is some shape-shifting stuff. So you know, you, your hems get longer and shorter depending on some kind of uh, influences. I don't know what it is yet, but I think it's, it's one of the most exciting um, fields. And I feel that there's gonna be a huge amount of innovation just as an architecture because it's necessary because people have the desire to use fashion, continue to use fashion as self-expression. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi Nick, do you have any like great 
words of wisdom for when things completely fall apart? Like you've worked on these big projects. Like how do you deal with someone that says like, this isn't going to happen? Well, Danny, um, um, no, I don't have any great words of wisdom. Just fucking carry on. I mean, it's like pull yourself up and you say, maybe one thing is um, that I can say, and that's from my experience. Um, we're very attached to our ideas, but our ideas are not us. So if someone doesn't buy your idea or criticizes your idea, take it personally, but not too personally, because it's not about you, it's just an idea. And chances are, and, and I, I try to you know, show that in my little short stories, that it's not necessarily that your idea sucks. It might be that it just, is not in the interest of your audience right now because they want to earn money and, and your idea maybe doesn't make money too much or they have other priorities or you're just ahead of your time and people need to catch up with it. So there are so many ways why an idea might not be successful in the moment um, that, are not, that are not even a judgment call about your idea. So the art of, of, I think, persuasion, to be able to talk about your ideas, to get an advocate, to get someone who might, you know, get the ear of someone who actually can make you, help you make something happen, that is super important, yeah? So try to find allies. I think that's, that's the best uh, tip I can give you and just carry on. And don't throw those ideas away because put them in a drawer and there might be a point the right time to, to pull them out again. Thanks. Hi, I have a question. I have an um, idea. Oh, sorry, not idea, question. Thanks for your ideas. Um, what do you, well, we always kind of ask everyone that comes, what do you think is going to happen kind of thing? But um, this trend towards, I mean, it's been happening, but of course it's just exploded with Facebook that's now meta and, um, I noticed most of your designs are physical and mm -hmm. external. And um, this, this kind of relationship between us as designers and where design goes and it using materials and building and changing environment and changing everything outside. Um, do you think that this kind of controversial space of designing interior and virtual spaces is better, worse, more sustainable. I mean, we're not going to be using as much material to mm -hmm. build these landscapes and clothes and things that we might be using in that space. Um, so yeah, just kind of like that relationship between how much has to be used to create new designs and then demolished and dismantled and rebuilt. Yeah. So, so Samantha, you, 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 it, is it more about like the, the, the relationship between, you know, design for the still called virtual or the digital realm versus design for the physical realm? Is that kind of what yeah, this question is? Yeah, kind of like that, like how do you, hmm. how, where do you see that going yeah. and, or where do you, maybe fit yourself in that. With yeah, that's, that's, that's a great a question. Basis. Yeah, that's a great question. There's many, many um, avenues to take this in as an answer. So, so one thing is that um, I truly believe, believe that a lot of our life is going to be digital. It already is. And, and that there's no stopping that. It's going to increase more and more. The thing that I believe though, is that what has to happen, what has to change is that our, too much of our life right now is on this piece of real estate. And if I take now a post-it here that I have on my desk here, yeah. This post-it is even almost bigger than the real estate that provides all my information, all my entertainment, all my communication, my view of the world is filtered and, and compressed onto this piece of real estate. Well, I happen to be uh, one meter 85 tall. 
Yeah. So the scale difference between me as a person that has a body that has senses covering this body and this thing that is supposed to provide everything, that's just outrageous. That's wrong. So, so I, I'm, I'm often talking about the second digital revolution. The first one brought us all these screens and the second one should help us to get rid of all these screens and liberate all that content. So it becomes more human scale and it aligns more with our, you know, with our senses, for example. Yeah, it is right now we have to conform to technology and that's ridiculous. Technology has to conform to us, otherwise it's completely senseless. So I see this explosion of the digital merging with the physical space in ways that um, maybe your generation is going to figure out. Maybe I'm too much of an old fart for that, but this is this is something that is bound to happen. So there will be a, a, a at a certain point almost no more distinction between okay, what is what is physical, what is virtual, and we're seeing this to start. So that's one way, and that's maybe the positive vision that I have uh, towards that. The other thing, um, when you talk about, okay, maybe what consumes more resources, if you build things in physical and build things electronically or digitally, um, yesterday I talked to a friend and he said, um, do you know how much energy it takes to send one photo to your friends or post one photo um, on your mobile? That takes more energy than a light bulb burning for three hours. So right now we don't even know, just because there's no physicality, we think there is no environmental impact on what we do here. And it is a crazy ass impact uh, in terms of energy if, if you work in digital. So I think this balance uh, is, is much more uh, 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 radical than, than, than we thought so far. And, you know, with the discussion about how much energy is used to, to, to mine crypto, for example, I wasn't aware of that. You know, I had to learn that maybe half a year ago. And so, so the impact of, of our creations and in which medium we're creating, um, I, I think we haven't fully grasped that yet. Great, thank you. Hi, I have a question oh, about... Um, how do you stay up to date on the latest technology? Like, I feel like it's developing faster than we can. And besides reading the news, like, is there some source where you, or, or do you, do people come to you? Like, how do you, like that, that e-paper, how, yeah. how do you learn about these things? Well, I got lucky. They, they actually came to me because I experimented with another material, which is LCD glass, which is classic and turned from clear to opaque. And I did a couple, uh, um, uh, big public art installations out of this material and then they saw okay this guy can do this um, we're going to ask him if he wants to work with our material but that doesn't happen very often to be honest you know that's that's very rarely a, a, a thing happens that technology actually finds you um, at craft brand lab um, um, our little agency where we do a lot of future forward work um, we the, the job description of many of our people who work for us is, is truffle pig. So truffle pigs, you know, have this amazing nose and they can smell the truffle through layers of dirt and know where to dig. So truffle pigs, you, you have to have truffle pigs uh, who have, you know, that passion and, and curiosity and they look, once again, not so much at cu curated, pre-curated, what is hip, what is new design websites, but they, 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 they look at different things. They look at, you know, boring scientific stuff, yeah? Um, they watch very strange, nerdy things. Um, they read science fiction. Um, they, I don't know, and they just have a way of walking through the world where they just stumble across stuff. I mean, most of the invention that we call invention, creative invention, is usually combining two things that don't necessarily fit together yet. That's how a joke works. That's how invention works. You take two things and, oh, this is a material that was originally made for tiny little screens. What if I made it really big? You know, and, and this is kind of Dan Goods from, from NASA JPL. I mean, he's like, he's, he's the master of, of truffle pigging. 
of finding like this crazy ass technology and then making something else out of it. So I can't really, I, I, I can't really give you like hands on advice, go to this website, but I can, it's, it's more a mindset. It's more an attitude um, that, that will be very helpful. And then you will be surprised what, what you will discover. Thank you. Nicholas? Nic Nicholas? Yes, Ralph. Yeah, um, you said you're an old fart, but I don't think you're an old enough fart to have been around in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that I think this is more disruptive than the 60s, what we're, what we're headed into or we're, what we're in right now. And I think all of this operates within a social ecology or whatever you want to call that. You brought up the Nazis, and I'm going to say there's a lot of similarities. The book burnings of the Nazis, the interstate censor, censor, the internet censorship that's going on nowadays. Uh, stigmatizing a group of people versus today stigmatizing certain groups of people. Uh, the violence, summer of 2020, a lot of, pe a lot of people are not aware of the Antifa rioting in Portland, Seattle, all these cities, if you weren't on certain channels, you wouldn't have seen this. And I see a lot of protest in Germany, what, what's going on there more than in America. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think the two forces are the centralization of power, people who like to control other people mm -hmm. and individualization. And I think a good example of this is uh, Klaus Schwab, COVID-19 and the Great Reset, if you've seen that book or seen quotes or anything, those are the two opposing forces that are happening. And I think you brought up cryptocurrency. That's one thing that is a counterforce to central banks and the fiat currencies that are solely inflating or going to collapse. Who mm -hmm. knows? I'd like your opinion on where you see these two forces going. And I'll say, you know, where's the Bob Dylan's of today? But, you know, Artists are typically in the forefront of the individualization mm -hmm. movement. I don't see anybody who's standing up. Um, uh, Eric Clapton did and got smashed down because of his reaction to, to the, his vaccination. But uh, I don't see the artists standing up there for, uh, for uh, individualization. Anyway, I'd like your opinion on that. No, oh, that's a tall order, Ralph. Um... I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there is something there's, you know, that the, there's, there's a very astute observation of, you know, that, that you have centralization on one hand and you radical centralization on one hand and radical individualization on the other hand. Um, I believe, though, that um, the world is not going, you know, the net net of people is not getting any better and not getting any worse. I would dare to say that the percentage of assholes is pretty equally distributed throughout history and throughout cultures and nations and states. The only thing that's different is the means on how they can act on their assholiness. So right now, assholes can, you know, can, can spread their word much more easier than, than before and they can, you know, uh, uh, mobilize other people much easier than before or you know um, in, in countries that have a high density of, of, of you know privately owned weapons um, the, the the way to, 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 to do physically harm is getting much easier for these assholes but the number of assholes is always the same so I don't know if that really answers the question uh, you could also turn around the, the number of people who are really courageous and really want to innovate and you know are, are fighting for the rights is probably also the same you had freedom fighters in the middle ages they got burnt you know so so um i i don't know i'm, I'm very wary of saying like things go much better or things go much worse i think the circumstances and the means they are changing and there's few things that you know like our global climate catastrophe that is the same that's on one trajectory that is not something that's even this is something that really comes to a culmination point that hopefully will galvanize big parts of civilization to do something about it and how difficult that is we just learned uh, uh, again at the uh, uh, at the summit so I don't know if this brings any um, any direct answer to you 
um, the one thing that I really believe is, is uh, into is, is creativity and the urge to invent ourselves, invent, reinvent ourselves, invent solutions to the most dire problems. And that is our rocket fuel. And, you know, if we're able to, to collaborate and to channel our creative energy, I think um, there's almost nothing we can't overcome.